Welcome to another edition of Football Insiders. David Brown, Jason Andera, recapping all the best that was in South Dakota high school football the previous week. Uh, we start, as always, in 11 AAA, where the game people were looking forward to the most, Lincoln against Harrisburg. We keep waiting for Lincoln to get tested. And the final score is 35 to 20, but there was some late stuff from Harrisburg. Uh, once again, Lincoln, it's not that they weren't tested, it's just that they, they have passed every test so far this season. I, I love how they come out so strong in the first quarter all season long on their first or second drive. You know, they're punching it in for, for six, and then they're putting the pressure on the other team defensively. And, you know, that's the part we've started to talk about a little bit more, but probably still not enough, is that this Lincoln defense yep. has been outstanding, and they gave a lot of trouble to the Harrisburg Tigers. You know, the vaunted receiver receiving core that they had, they held them in check. Yeah, they made some catches, but they held them in check. They got pressure on Sam Knuth. I really, really think this Lincoln team continues to get better every week. Yeah, they, they end up giving up 20 points, but again, some of those were late from Harrisburg. You, you discussed the Lincoln defense. Obviously, the offense gets, you know, most of the accolades, what with Tate Schaefer and Jack Smith and Jarofsky and, and you know, Hodge and all the weapons that they have out there. But what, what's interesting to me is, you know, you, you try not to make comparisons, but this is looking a lot like the Jefferson team from last season in that they're a clear number one and they get tested, but they pass every test, as I mentioned earlier. It's like they know they have the target on their back now, but they seem to be adjusting to it in a weird way. I think that's a that's a good comment. I mean, last year we saw, what, the closest game for Jefferson? A, almost points. a three-score game, yeah. And it'll be the same type of thing this year with Lincoln. Of course, they've got a huge test this week. But so far, so good for them. And it's because they've got the defensive unit. They've got the offensive unit. They don't have very many players that have to play both ways. The offensive line is ridiculously yeah. good. I think they don't get enough credit as well. And then, you, you know, Tate Schaefer is that good. Like, he d has plenty of time to throw, but if he doesn't, you know, he can make more time in the in the backfield and somebody's going to be open. And you throw in Mikey Roach, and a sophomore who's had a tremendous year, he's got four or five targets on every play that somebody's going to get open. And as you mentioned, the test this week, again, it's a one versus two matchup, Lincoln versus O'Gorman from Howard Wood Field. We're going to have that game right here on Midcoast Sports. Very excited. Uh, the second part of the doubleheader, first game, Mitchell versus Jefferson. But uh, focusing specifically on that Pats Knights game, uh, they're the only two teams that are undefeated left in 11 AAA. Both of them are 4 0. We've seen O'Gorman get tested. They needed that last second touchdown to beat Brandon Valley way back when, but O'Gorman still has plenty of weapons, so this Lincoln defense is going to be tested once again. Lincoln hasn't seen the type of weapons that O'Gorman has, and that's for sure. Uh, but as we get deeper into the game, and in the, this happened last year, O'Gorman got a big lead. Lincoln came back, but, but O'Gorman got the win, right? But this year, the fourth quarter is going to be different. If it's a close game, I think the fourth quarter is going to be really tough for O'Gorman to compete when their quarterback goes both ways, Ryland Satter goes both ways, Henry Theobald goes yep. both ways, Maverick Jones goes, goes both ways. It's just going to be really tough in a fourth quarter situation if you have a close game between O'Gorman and Lincoln. Um, but it'll be a huge test, and I think it'll be a really good first half. As we mentioned, it's a one versus two matchup. Lincoln stays at number one this week with a win over Harrisburg. O'Gorman shut out Rapid City Stevens. Jefferson is number three. They shut out Rapid City Central. Harrisburg four, Brandon Valley five. The top five stayed exactly the same as it was a week ago. Uh, I have no qualms with this top five. It's the same way I voted. Yeah, it's the exact same way I voted. I think um, Roosevelt, you know, not playing up to the standard that we thought maybe would get them ranked at some point kept them out of the top five. Washington went on the road against a double-A team. We thought, you know, they're a fringe team that maybe could make a move. They played a really good game, but but Watertown, you know, really picked them apart yep. in the passing game. So I think those two teams, you know, are thinking about possibly being in the rankings, but I think your top five are correct. And, and with Roosevelt, they still really have not played a game with a complete roster yet, so it's, it's really tough yeah, to gauge no the Jackson rough Yeah, no Jackson Graven good last week. Yeah, so it's really tough to gauge the Rough Riders right now. Uh, they lost to Brandon Valley last week, 35 nothing. So looking at this top five and this top two matchup again, this is another test for Lincoln. They've passed the test against Jefferson. They've passed the test against Harrisburg, the three and four teams. Now they get the number two team. And it's going to be a lot of excitement, and I can't wait to have this one on TV. We went out to go visit with both O'Gorman and Lincoln to see if they were excited for the matchup, and you can bet they were. But they're like really good playmakers, so I think that will be tougher than we've faced all year. It's going to be a dogfight until the very end. You know, Lincoln's a great team. It's been pumped up. Coaches, coaches know what's up. We know what's going on. We've been looking for, forward to this game for 
start of the season. They got a lot of good dudes, but I mean, so do we. It's really like lighting a fire under our butts, yeah. Because we really want to beat these guys. We want to prove that we're probably the best team in South Dakota. So yeah. It'll be the best competition we've had, and it'll be exciting. Also, I think we're just better prepared for higher competition. If we just stick to like what we're doing, I think we can we can stick with them to the very end. Yeah. Yeah, I think excitement's an understatement. Uh, I, I think every side knows what's at stake here in this one versus two battle. Again, we're going to have it on Midco Sports as the second part of the Howard Wood doubleheader on Friday. Uh, the first game will be Mitchell against Jefferson. That's the double A versus triple A matchup. Uh, the other big matchup this week, uh, Roosevelt against Harrisburg. We'll see if Harrisburg bounces back. And again, we'll see if the Rough Riders can put a complete game together just because they've been undermanned throughout most of the season. And they have to reacquaint themselves with the offense that they have now with some yeah. of these new players. And Jackson Brower, you know, he's got potential to be one of the top quarterbacks in this class. There's no doubt about it. He hasn't reached that potential yet, but I, I think he's got a lot of upside that he can still hit. Uh, but Harrisburg playing at home, they're going to be a really tough opponent. And I think Harrisburg has a chance to bounce back and really assert themselves as, you know, being one of the top two or three contenders to maybe make a trip to the Dome. And Brandon Valley, the number five team, they're going to be at Rapid City Stevens, that one on Saturday. Uh, let's move to double A. Double A yeah. was probably the most interesting class last week, if yes. we're being honest. Um, Pierre honestly has its first test of the season. Uh, they end up defeating Yankton 27 14, but this is a game that Yankton led at halftime. They shut Pierre out at halftime. Pierre had not been shut out at halftime in nine years, or <laughs> uh, seven years, excuse me. Um, and then it's a tie game in the fourth quarter, and that governor experience eventually paid off. Uh, let's start with Pierre first, because we'll, we'll obviously get to the Yankton performance in a minute, but it's good for Pierre probably to have games like this and, and not have it just all be blowouts. It, it probably is, yeah. It's a little bit of a stress test to see what can they handle. And in this game, um, Yankton you know, got an interception early. They knocked Cade Kaiser out of the game for a couple of plays. They were disconcerted in this first half, and... Um, they had to make some adjustments, and one of those adjustments they made in the second half was to bring Trey Lewis in and let him run the ball. So the adjustments paid off for Pierre, but anytime you make a team make adjustments and you, you stress test them and you, you see what they can handle, it's going to make you better in the end. I think that's a good point. And Kaiser did not have his best game. He was 12 of 25, 170 yards, a touchdown and a pick, as you mentioned. But as you said, the key was bringing in Trey Lewis. And we've discussed in the past how Pierre has so many weapons, but it's always been the receiving weapons. I mean, we, we've known about Mosier. We've known about Lewis. We, we know about their backs, but their backs have not really had these, like, breakout performances in these blowouts. They've kind of been just like, oh, they're just adding, you know, yards and points, you know, in garbage time. But this was the game where if the Govs could have that complimentary running game to this aerial assault they've always had, this was the game to show it. And Trey Lewis is easily the player of the game. You know, he played a little bit of running back as a sophomore and then last year went almost exclusively defense. And you can see the difference between Trey Lewis two years ago and the difference between senior Trey Lewis he is so strong, and uh, he has used that strength. You know, the offensive line definitely did their job, but he did a lot of his own running where he would take contact and take it another five yards. He would take contact, and then he would hit a, a seam and take it another 20 or 30 yards. And the third quarter was amazing for Trey Lewis. And, and give that guy all the credit in the world. He really sparked that comeback. Uh, but this game was close. Into the fourth quarter, um, we were talking a seven-point game before Pierre finally sealed the game off with when they went for it on in their own territory on yeah. fourth down, got the first down, and then eventually got a touchdown to make it look like a two-score lead. But this thing was close all the way down to the end. Yeah, Trey Lewis ends up finishing with 164 rushing yards and a touchdown uh, for the Govs. But for Yankton, um, I, I think we had kind of been cautiously optimistic. I don't know if that's the right phrase about Yankton. They were kind of hovering in that 3-4-5 range preseason, beginning of the season, because we thought, oh, it's going to be Pierre, and it's going to be T. You know, T loses to O'Gorman. You know, it's a triple-A school. You can't really, you know, fault them too much for that. But uh, to me, Yankton, with this performance, even in a loss, yeah. again, there, there's no moral victories, but I think Yankton proved they're the second best team in this class. Uh, that's a great point. They really solidified to me that they are the contender in this class and they've got a chance to do that again yet this week but Lucas Kamshoff I mean this guy yeah. can throw a football and then to have the running attack that they have with Evan Sirk and Shaler Platt and then their receivers are, are speedy uh, defensively 
you know, they're going to have a little bit of work to do. I mean, yes, you shut out the governors in the first half, but there were some tackling mistakes. Um, they got some big takeaways, and they're not going to get that every game. I think defensively they still have a little bit of work to do to, to be, you know, a real threat to peer, but, but they are the team right now to contend with them. I think this game, again, even in a loss, and, and again, we say no moral victories, but I think this game, if, if we're talking down the line, it, we could flash forward two months from now, and this is the matchup at the Dakota Dome, and you're going to get a lot of people from Yankton coming in because it's close to Vermillion. You yep. just never know. Uh, I think this Yankton I, team with you. Can, can do some damage, uh, and we're going to talk about their matchup next week in a second. You mentioned it during the uh, AAA portion. Uh, the other big result is that double-A Watertown over Washington, 41-27. Uh, Watertown gets a pick six late as Washington's driving, so the two-score game is a little misleading. Uh, but the thing about Watertown for me is that it wasn't just Juven Hudson. It was a lot of guys contributing for the Arrows. It was it was a good job by Trayton Hemrick, who, you know, they haven't had to rely on their quarterback to make plays, and he stepped up and made plays. And you're right, Juven Hudson still had his 100-yard game and a touchdown, but you know, they didn't need everything from right. Juven because they had such a good array. And honestly, I know it's a high-scoring game, but watching the game, their defense played a huge role in this victory. Uh, Micah Hawk, Jaden Lambert, uh, Caden Bocamp, some of these guys really stepped up and had huge games and made big plays when they needed to. And, uh, you know, it's weird because you talk about Yankton shutting out Pierre in the first half, and they might need some improvement on defense. And you, know, you talk about Watertown, who, you know, got in the shootout with Watertown, or Washington, and, right. and I'm praising their defense. But it, that's really what it looked like when you actually watched the games. Um, and then Owen Sports, Sparts, yeah, comes in with that big interception at the end of the game to seal the deal. But you mentioned uh, Trayton Hemrick, four passing touchdowns for the Arrows. Uh, and they just continue to, to improve and to, and to be a, a nice team. And now they get their test. Uh, this is going to be about as awesome of double-A matchups as you can. The top five are Pier, Yankton, T, Watertown, Spearfish, same as last week. And the top four all face each other this week. So one versus four. <laughs> one versus four, Pier versus Watertown, and two versus three, Yankton against T. Uh, let's start with Watertown at Pier. They have to go on the road. This is a big test. We know that Pier was tested on the road themselves last week. So you know the governors, even with the win, probably are saying to themselves, we can play a lot better. And then if you're Watertown, it's basically like, okay, you've shown us some signs this mm -hmm. year. W w what do those signs mean? And this matchup will tell us. Well, Watertown's going to have to come out and establish physicality. Their offensive line can match up with Pierre. Not many teams in AA can match up with Pierre on the offensive line. And that means good news for Juven Hudson because they'll still be able to move the ball on a team like Pierre. What they're going to have to do is limit big plays. I mean, Watertown gave up a lot of big plays and a couple of plays that could have been big plays that were drops for Washington, uh, they're, you know, Pierre's going to take advantage of that. They're going to make huge plays on the offensive side. So they're going to have to find a way to, you know, do what teams are doing against the Chiefs and just, you know, keep everything close to the line of scrimmage and don't let anything get behind you because Pierre will definitely take advantage of that if they do. So Watertown at Pierre and then Yankton is at T2 versus 3. And again, Pierre and, or excuse me, Yankton and T have kind of flip-flopped between two and three the past couple weeks. Uh, I think with Yankton's performance, and you agree, they're a clear number two. And with T, they got a blowout win against Douglas last week. Nothing, nothing you could really discern about that victory. But uh, th this game will, will also learn a lot about both of these teams because they're both in contention down the stretch. This very easily could be a semifinal rematch down the line. Uh, I, I just don't know what to expect from T, honestly, just because they've been not necessarily off the season, but they had some close games early. The O'Gorman game was you know, a bit of a track meet, and then this Douglas game, I don't know if you learned much from it. So I, I think T we're gonna learn more about in this game than Yankton. Amen to that. And they came in with less experience than they've had in the past, but sometimes you, know, you can use that and get more improvement throughout a season than most teams because they're learning and getting better every week. We don't know. This is the, the huge test for T to see if Brenner Conrad steps up and, and can make some of those big plays. Ellingson on the outside coming up and making some of those big plays. Keegan DeYoung has been steady for them, but they need more than him um, to stop a uh, Yankton offense that's really fast on the outside. So I think Yankton has an opportunity to make some of their own big plays on the outside. And I'll tell you what, Lucas Kamshoff is going to be a tough quarterback to stop for T, and T's really good. These can be very similar 
when they played O'Gorman with a lot of weapons on the outside. And, we, and it's going to be kind of similar. I almost wonder if Yankton might use the Huron blueprint of week one where you kind of, you know, use the passing game to set things up just because when Huron was able to pass yeah. on T, that was the game that kind of was the wake-up call at least early in week one that – you know, teams can compete with T. And again, T is great. T has been a consensus number two or number three team in this class. We're not trying yeah. to dog them oh, in no. any way, but there's just things that they, in, in my mind, they just haven't proved this year yet. Well, Yankton's on the road in this one, and, you know, if there's a line on it, Yankton's the favorite in this yeah. game. And uh, T will probably take exception to that and say, wait a second, and we'll see if they can respond to that or if they do need a few more games to be at their best before playoffs start. Yankton and T, Watertown and Pier, these four schools, top four schools in double A, all facing each other on Friday. Moving down to 11A, uh, Del Rapids, an impressive, impressive win over Canton, 48 to 30. Uh, the, the run game is, is always strong, but I think with Del Rapids coming off that close battle against 11B Hot Springs, uh, the amount of offense that the Courier showed it was really impressive, honestly. Yeah, they established the run against a team that loved to run. They shut down you know that vaunted the hurricane, the hurricane backfield and they got some huge turnovers in that first half and i think you said it jack henry he's had to throw i think an average of seven times a game but he's pretty much six for seven every single game <laughs> with over 100 yards passing he's been nearly perfect in the passing game when they've needed him um this was this was a huge huge step in the right directions for Del Rapids who have really come back really strong after having that close game with Hot Springs a couple weeks ago. Yeah, Henry was great. Mason Stubbe was always who's always phenomenal on the ground was great. Uh, we, we talked about it last week, how West Central might get a challenge at Vermilion. Yeah. They, they passed that 41-7. to uh, Sioux Falls Christian 21-15 over Madison as the number four team. Uh, looking at the top five, Del Rapids stays at one, West Central two, Canton three, Christian four, and then Lennox five. Uh, even though Christian's two and two, uh, I, I think you, me, and the other voters recognize the difficult schedule that the Chargers have faced. And so being two and two and number four, I think, is a, is a pretty fair ranking. And, and playing Madison's not that big of a letdown. You look at them, and just because Madison hasn't collected the wins, they they were in a good game with Madison, yep. but Cole Snyder came up huge. Eight catches, 189 yards receiving. Lincoln Prince had his best throwing game of the year. So I think they were trying to show, hey, we can throw the ball because all year they've been running it. And then Lincoln Prince comes out with a 300-yard throwing game. Uh, Cole Snyder is, has a huge day offensively and then two picks on defensively. He's made a huge difference since he's come back in the last two weeks. Um, the score didn't reflect it, but I, I feel like this showed – Sioux Falls Christian's versatility is going to get stronger. They can, we all know they can run the ball, but now you got more things to worry about with that Charger offense. And, and this is essentially the halfway point of the regular season. They're just, they're just kind of lurking, like mm -hmm. beneath the surface a little they'll, bit. They'll uh, be there. They'll, they're going to be a factor down the stretch. Uh, the big game this week is two versus three, West Central and Canton. Uh, smash mouth football, yeah. to, to say the least. Yeah, smash mouth football. I mean, I think we're going to have a couple of sneaky passes in this game. Caden Elfson came up with a couple of sneaky passes against um, Vermilion. But for the most part, yeah, look for Sarda, look for Bartman, look for these guys to just be running the ball down the field the best they can on the, on the other side. Kane and McCracken, Kane Walner, these guys are going to be just charging the other direction. So it's it really, to me, these games honestly come down to turnovers. And the game that Canton played the worst this year was against Del Rapids last week when they had turnover trouble in the first half. If they can hold on to the ball, this game is... This game is dead even. Yeah, I, I don't think it's going to be a 48 to 30 game. I think it's, this game's probably going to be in the 20s, if that, with with all the running that's going on. But I think so. Uh, that's going to be the big matchup in 11A is West Central against Canton. Uh, to 11B we go. Uh, winner, no issue at Lee Deadwood, 52 to nothing. They're off next week against, uh, or they're off next week. Then they face Bridgewater, Emory, Ethan. Actually, both those teams are off next week, so they'll both get a bye yeah. before facing each other. That'll be a one versus five matchup, at least as it stands right now. Uh, the big one was Sioux Valley against Bridgewater Emory Ethan. That was a top five matchup coming in. We had seen Sioux Valley pass an earlier test against Elk Point Jefferson. That one at home. This one on the road. And uh, my goodness, uh, Sioux Valley is is definitely the number two team in the league. Yeah, and the, you know their issue is is can their offensive line continue to produce big games because they've got the athletes to run the ball. And Bowden Schiller, you know, he can make a lot of it on his own, but. When they play those tough teams like Bridgewater, Emory, Ethan, they need to dominate the line, and they dominated the line. So that's great news for the Cossacks and all the fans up in Volga because 
I, I think this vaults them into elite competition, elite contention. Yeah, they're five and zero. Winners five and zero. Uh, Elk Point, uh, they're number three. They got to win at McCook Central, Montrose, Hot Springs. They got to win at St. Thomas More, and then Bridgewater rounds out the top five. Uh, none of the matchups really in 11B are our top five matchups. Again, we got the one and five teams off. We got other schools, uh, you know, facing teams that are not in the rankings. But uh, something that you wanted to point out, <laughs> the battle for co-op supremacy. I'm going to look down to make sure I get it right. This no, don't be, look down. Just uh, this, see if you can do it. Oh, my goodness. Uh, Trip, Delmont, Armor, Andy Central, Dakota, Dakota Christian, Christian <laughs> against... Woonsocket, Westington Springs, Sanborn Central. Central. Look at hey, you. There we go. Let's go. All right. I have it written down here. Yep. Trip Delmont Armor, Andy Central, Dakota Christian against Woonsocket, Westington Springs, Sanborn Central. And it's the Blackhawks versus the Thunderhawks. So you got to love the, it. The battle for Hawks supremacy and co-op supremacy. This is interesting, though, because coming into the year, these are the two teams that were under the radar. And TDA, ACDC came in as the team that you, you knew had some improvement in them. And, you know, they haven't had the record the same as, as uh, Woonsocket, Westington Springs, Sanborn Central. But I think they're really showing to improve. And then Woonsocket, Westington Springs, Sanborn Central, undefeated still on the year. They, they've got a good team. Kenny Heater has done a good job. And they're probably a little better than people think. So not only is it interesting because there are, what, 20-some words in, in the game, uh, between the two co-ops. 12. 12, okay. 20, <laughs> Close 20, 20 some means 12. Uh, but I do think, I do think Woonsocket could really get a, an important win here as well. I just like how TDA ACDC rolled off the tongue <laughs> and then you're like, Woon Woonsocket, WWSSC. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, yeah. Either TDA way, ACDC, I mean, that's... Well, ACDC makes it a little yeah. bit easier. But uh, yeah, Thunderhawks and Blackhawks uh, in a fun matchup in 11B this week. Uh, to the nine-man ranks. Uh, Nuble, Parkston, no problem with Old Ed, Ramona Rutland. Uh, the, the top five really didn't have much of an issue, except Elton Lake Benton losing, 9AA Elton Lake Benton losing to 9A Canastota. So now Canastota has beaten a 9AA opponent twice this season. Remember, they beat yeah, Howard ones. week one. Good yeah, ranked ones. Yeah, they've yeah. beaten two top five teams in the class above them. And we had joked in earlier weeks, you know, should Canastota be number one over Warner in 9A? Uh, yeah, now, now they, they're starting, they really should. They're starting to feel like it, and defensively they have stepped up big time. Um, nice job by Tage Ortman to, to distribute the ball. He didn't force anything down the field, didn't make any – bad plays and then you know we know he can run and pass he's a great dual threat quarterback but that was huge to do that against elkton lake benton and elkton lake benton that was one of their biggest tests this year i think they did all right i mean mm -hmm. playing against a team like Can canisota to be in the game especially at the end of the first half and then the second half really low scoring second half and canisota able to hold them off but I think I think Elkton Lake Benton's got a you know got some good things to take out of that game as well. They're still four and one, number five in nine double A. Uh, the nine A rankings, of course, Canastota one, Warner two. They won a big at Castlewood. Uh, Harding County Bison won big at Newell. Phillip big against Dupree, and then Alcester Hudson undefeated, sneaking in after their victory over Chester. Uh, but the big question is, can Canastota do it against a nine double A school again? Because they got Hanson this week. And Hanson, probably one of the sleepers in 9AA. They've got two losses on the year, but, you know, against Parkston and against Howard. Like, two really good 9AA teams. So, yeah, don't sleep on Hanson. I think Canastota is going to have to play just as well as they played against Howard and Elk Elkton Lake Benton to get by a team like Hanson. In 9B, Falkton's number one, DeSmet's number two, Avon, Corsica, Stickney, Hitchcock, Tulare. Uh, the DeSmet win over Woolsey Westington, they win above them and Woolsey Westington falls out of the top five in 9A. Yeah and uh, you know coming off that high high at the beginning of the year beating Gregory That's beating right. the state champs things were looking really good for them but uh, Moshe Richmond and Caleb Richmond um, you know they've been held in check the last couple of weeks and Dismet I mean that was a close game it was tied until the last half and Dismet pulled out one touchdown in the second half it was it was a nail biter back and forth but Give just Met credit. This is a it's one of the biggest wins they'll have all year, and they're looking like they'll probably be a one-loss team all the way into the playoffs now. I think you know, you look at Dismet, and they're as good as anybody in that class, even including Falkton, who's undefeated right now, and knocking people over left and right. Uh, some other one-loss teams in 9B. Corsica Stickney will be at Avon, so that's a four versus three matchup That'll in be an 9B. One. And then the other thing, number one, Falkton. 
They, they've been number one throughout the season in 9B. They are at Warner in 9A. Warner's been number one a couple times. Number two currently a big test for both sides. A big test for both sides. And if Falkton wants to show that they've really moved up a notch, they showed it earlier with the win over Ipswich early in the year, a team that they struggled with the last couple of years. Both of these teams have that common opponent in Ipswich. Both had very similar results, really. Mm -hmm. So I think I think this game is closer than people think. I think... You know, just looking at it, you'd, you'd say, oh, Warner, Warner's the team to beat here, uh, playing at home, playing in a tougher class. But Falkton's going to give them trouble. Uh, but in the end, I think the physicality for the Warner Monarchs might be too much for Falkton. But don't be surprised if Falkton makes this one a close game. It's a couple of undefeated teams, 4-0 Warner, 5-0 Falkton. It's another fun week of high oh, school yeah. football. And we got, as I said, a doubleheader. Mitchell against Jefferson, that's at 5. Lincoln and O'Gorman, the 1 versus 2 matchup in AAA, that's at 8. We'll be on the call for some of those games. We're going to split that, games. yeah. We're, we're going to split that. I got Jefferson, you got Lincoln O'Gorman. And you got to get back here and, and then, get busy. Yeah, got to get back here. Yeah, we still have Varsity Sports Live on Friday, uh, 1030. You'll join us at, at some point. Depends yeah. on the uh, traffic out at Howard Woodfield, yeah. I guess. How the game goes, too. I, mean, I suppose, yeah, that too. Lincoln's <laughs> played in three running clock games this year out of their four games. I don't think this will be one. I don't think so, either. I think you're going to have to have a full uh, 48 minutes. I guess and I will enjoy every single minute. Absolutely. He's Jandy. I'm Brownie. We will see you next week on Football Insiders.